This is a study some of you think you know about, but very few people have ever read the story. You watch, you watch the movie. This is a Stanley Milgram, little Jewish kid from the Bronx, and he asked the question, could the Holocaust happen here? Now. He said, no, that's Nazi Germany, that's Hitler. You know, that's 1939. He said, yeah, but suppose Hitler asked you, would you electrocute a stranger? No way, not me, I'm a good person. He said, why don't we put you in a situation and give you a chance to see what you would do? And so what he did was he tested a thousand ordinary people. 500 New Haven, Connecticut, 500 Bridgeport. And the, the ad said, psychologists want to understand memory. We want to improve people's memory because memory is a key to success, okay? We're going to give you five bucks, uh, four dollars for your time. And he said, we don't want college students, we want men between 20 and 50, in the latest studies they ran women, ordinary people, barbers, clerks, white collar people. So you go down, and one of you is going to be a learner, one of you is going to be a teacher. The learner is a genial middle-aged guy. He gets tied up to the shock apparatus in another room. The learner could be the middle-aged, could be as young as 20. And one of you is told by the authority, the guy in the lab coat, your job as teacher is to give this guy material to learn. Gets it right, reward him. Gets it wrong, you press a button on the shock box. First button is 15 volts. He doesn't even feel it. That's the key. All evil starts with 15 volts. And then the next step is another 15 volts. The problem is, at the end of the line, is 450 volts. And as you go along, the guy is screaming, I've got a heart condition, I'm out of here. You're a good person. You complain. Sir, who's going to be responsible if something happens to him? Experiment says, don't worry, I will be responsible. Go, continue, teacher. And the question is, who would go all the way to 450 volts? I sh you should notice here, when it gets up to 375, it says, danger, severe shock. When it gets up to here, there's triple X, the pornography of power. <laughs> so Milgram asked 40 psychiatrists, how many, what percent of American citizens would go to the end? They said only 1%, because that's sadistic behavior, and we know, psychiatry knows, only 1% of Americans are sadistic. Okay. Here's the data. They could not be more wrong. Two-thirds go all the way to 450 volts. This was just one study. Milgram did more than 16 studies. And look at this. In study 16, where you see somebody like you go all the way, 90% go all the way. In study 5, if you see people rebel, 90% rebel. What about women? Study 13, no different than men. So Milgram is quantifying evil as to the willingness of people to blindly obey authority to go all the way to 450 volts. And it's like a dial on human nature. A dial in the sense that you can make almost everybody totally obedient down to the majority, down to none. So what are the external parallels? All research is artificial. What's the validity in the real world? 912 American citizens committed suicide or were murdered by family and friends in Guyana jungle in 1978 because they were blindly obedient to this guy, their pastor, not the priest, their pastor, Reverend Jim Jones. He persuaded them to commit mass suicide. Uh, and so he's the modern Lucifer effect, a man of God who becomes the angel of death. Milgram's study is all about individual authority to control people. Most of the time, we are in institutions. So the Stanford Prison Study is the study of the power of institutions to influence individual behavior. Interestingly, Stanley Milgram and I were in the same high school class in James Monroe in the Bronx, 1954. Uh, so this study, which I did with my graduate students, especially Craig Haney, we also began with, with an ad. We didn't have money, so we had cheap little ad. But we wanted college students for study of prison life. 75 people volunteered, took personality tests, we did interviews, picked two dozen, most normal, most healthy, randomly assigned them to be prison and guard. So on day one, we knew we had good apples, I'm going to put them in a bad situation, and secondly, we know there's no difference between the boys who are going to be guards, the boys who are going to be prisoners. The kids who are going to be prisoners just said, wait at home in the dormitories, so the study will begin Sunday. We didn't tell them that the city police were going to come and do realistic arrests. police car pulls up in front and a cop comes to the front door and knocks and says he's looking for me. So they, right there, they, you know, they took me out the door, they put my hands against the um, 
car. It was a real cop car. It was a real policeman. And there were real neighbors in the street who didn't know that I was, uh, this was an uh, uh, experiment. And there was cameras all around and neighbors all around. And they put me in the car. Then they drove me around Palo Alto. They took me to the, to the police station, the basement of the police station. Then they put me in a cell. I was the first one to be picked up, so they put me in a cell, which was just like a room with a door with bars on it. Uh, you could tell it wasn't a real jail. They locked me in there in this degrading little outfit. They were taking this experiment too seriously. Here are the prisoners who are going to be dehumanized. They're going to become numbers. Here are the guards with the symbols of power and anonymity. Uh, guards get prisoners to clean the toilet bowls out their bare hands, to do other humiliating tasks. They strip them naked. They sexually taunt them. They begin to do degrading activities, like having them simulate sodomy. You saw simulating fellatio uh, in Soldiers in Abu Ghraib. My guards did it in five days. The stress reaction was so extreme that normal kids we picked because they're healthy had breakdowns within 36 hours. The study ended after uh, six days because it had, was out of control. Five kids had emotional breakdowns. Does it make a difference if warriors go to battle changing their appearance or not? Does it make a difference if they're anonymous in how they treat their victims? We know in some cultures they go to war, they don't change their appearance. In other cultures, they paint themselves like Lord of the Flies. In some, they wear masks. In many, they wear soldiers are anonymous in uniform. So with this psych anthropologist, John Watson, found 23 cultures that had two bits of data. Do they change their appearance? 15. Uh, do they kill, torture, mutilate? 13. If they don't change their appearance, only one of eight kills, torture, mutilate. The key is in the red zone. If they change their appearance, 12 of 13, that's 90%, kill, torture, mutilate. And that's the power of anonymity. So what are the seven social processes that grease the slippery slope of evil? Mindlessly taking the first small step. Dehumanization of others. Deindividuation of self. Diffusion of personal responsibility. Blind obedience to authority. Uncritical conformity to group norms. Passive tolerance of evil through inaction or indifference. And it happens when you're in a new or unfamiliar situation. Your habitual response patterns don't work. Your personality and morality are disengaged. Nothing is easier than to denounce the evildoer. Nothing more difficult than understanding him, Dostoevsky tells us. Understanding is not excusing. Psychology is not excusiology. So social psychological research reveals how ordinary good people can be transformed without the drugs. You don't need it. You just need the social psychological processes. Real world parallels. Compare this with this. James Schlesinger, and I'm going to have to end with this, says, psychologists have attempted to understand how and why individuals and groups who usually act humanely can sometimes act otherwise in certain circumstances. That's the looser effect. And he goes on to say, the landmark Stanford study provides a cautionary tale for all military operations. If you give people power without oversight, it's a prescription for abuse. They knew that and let that happen. So another, another report, investigative report by General Fay, says the system is guilty. And in this report he says it was the environment created Abu Ghraib by leadership failures that contributed to the occurrence of such abuse. And the fact that it remained undiscovered by higher authorities for a long period of time. Those abuses went on for three months. Who was watching the store? The answer is nobody. I think nobody on purpose. He gave the guards permission to do those things and they knew nobody was ever going to come down to that dungeon. So you need a paradigm shift in all these areas. The shift is away from the medical model that focuses only on the individual. And the, the shift is toward a public health model that recognizes situational and systemic vectors of disease. Bullying is a disease. Prejudice is a disease. Violence is a disease. And since the Inquisition, we've been dealing with problems at the individual level. And you know what? It doesn't work. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. That means that line is not out there. That's a decision that you have to make. That's a personal thing. So I want to end very quickly on a positive note. Heroism as the antidote to evil. By promoting the heroic imagination, especially in our kids, in our educational system, we want kids to think, I'm a hero in waiting, waiting for the right situation to come along, and I will act heroically. My whole life is now going to focus away from evil that I've been in since I was a kid to understanding heroes. The banality of heroism is ord it's ordinary people who do heroic deeds. It's the counterpoint to Hannah Arendt's uh, banality of evil. Our traditional societal heroes are wrong because they, they are the exception. They organize their whole life around this. That's why we know their names. And our kids' heroes are also wrong models for them because they have supernatural talents. We want our kids to realize most heroes are everyday people. 
And the heroic act is unusual. This is Joe Darby. He was the one that stopped those abuses you saw because when he saw those images, he turned them over to a senior investigating officer. He was a low-level private, and that stopped it. Was he a hero? No. They had to put him in hiding because people wanted to kill him and then his mother and his wife. For three years, they were in hiding. This is the woman who stopped the Stanford prison study. And I said it got out of control. I was a prison superintendent. I didn't know it was out of control. I was totally indifferent. She came down, saw that madhouse, and said, you know what? It's terrible what you're doing to those boys. They're not prisoners, they're not guards, they're boys, and you are responsible. And I ended the study the next day. The good news is I married her the next year. <laughs> I just came to my senses, obviously. So, so situations have the power to do th the same, but it's the point is, it's the same situation that can, inst that can inflame the hostile imagination in some of us that makes us perpetrators of evil, can inspire the heroic imagination in others. It's the same situation, and you're on one side or the other. Most people are guilty of the evil of inaction because your mother says, don't get involved, uh, mind your own business. And you have to say, mama, humanity is my business. So the psychology of heroism is, we're gonna end in a moment, how do we encourage children in new hero courses that I'm working with Matt Langdon, he has a hero workshop, to develop this heroic imagination, this self-labeling, I am a hero in waiting, and teach them skills. To be a hero, you have to learn to be a deviant because you're always going against the conformity of the group. Heroes are ordinary people whose social action is extraordinary, who act. The key to heroes are two things. You have to act when other people are passive. B, you have to act sociocentrically, not egocentrically. And I want to end with a story that some of you know about Wesley Autry, New York subway hero, 50-year-old African-American construction worker. He's standing on a subway in New York. A white guy falls on the tracks. The subway train is coming. There are 75 people there. You know what? They freeze. He's got a reason not to get involved. He's black, the guy's white, and he's got two little kids. Instead, he gives his kids to a stranger, jumps on the tracks, puts the guy between the tracks, lays on him, the subway goes over him. Wesley and the guy, 20 and a half inches height. The train clearance is 21 inches. A half an inch would have taken his head off. And he said, I did what anyone could do, no big deal to jump the tracks, and the moral imperative is, I did what everyone should do. And so one day, you will be in a new situation. Take path one, you're gonna be a perpetrator of evil. Evil meaning you're going to be Arthur Anderson. You're going to cheat or you're going to allow bullying. Path two, you become guilty of the evil of passive inaction. Path three, you become a hero. The point is, are we ready to take the path to celebrating ordinary heroes, waiting for the right situation to come along to put heroic imagination into action? Because it may only happen once in your life. When you pass it by, you'll always know, I could have been a hero and I let it pass me by. So the point is thinking it and then doing it. So I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's oppose the power of evil systems at home and abroad, and let's focus on the positive. Advocate for respect of personal dignity, for justice and peace, which sadly our administration has not been doing. Thanks so much.